Good morning. Welcome to Society 2045. Today is Friday, May 20th, and our guest today is Michael Linton. Michael, good morning. How are you? Very happy to be here, Ken. Very, uh, I'm in good shape. It's nice weather up here, and we're ready to go. Well, we're delighted to have you. Um, Michael, what we usually do is start by asking you to introduce yourself rather than me reading a bio. So you're free to say who you are today. We're not going to hold you to it. You can be someone different tomorrow. So tell us a bit about yourself. Um, background in physics, engineering, started in the oil biz, was playing with computers in the 60s, didn't get it right, still can't, but um, like things that happen by accident, we came across the problem in the early 80s of no money and found we could, in our own hometown, on one computer, or one eight-inch floppy disk, create um, a virtual bank community currency process. And I've been stuck with it ever since. You can't let go of something when it's that good. So that's what I, I do. I do community currency systems. Uh, that's my gig. Fantastic. I, I saw in your bio that you have been called the father of uh, local economic trading systems or community currency systems. Tell us exactly what, what does that mean? What is a, a community currency? What's a local economic trading system? Well, it's, um, it's a convivial economy of um, a sort of reciprocal give and take an interaction amongst a cluster of agreeable people. And that doesn't mean we all agree with each other. It just means that we, we don't get into the fight stuff. And we knew we had no money, thanks to Ronald Reagan and Maggie Thatcher and the high interest rates. And so could we still work with each other, massage, art, crafts, um, legal services, whatever? Could we do these things? And we found, yes, we can, provided we can account for our to and fro in our own promises. So when I was, uh, say, taking legal advice for something and I wanted to pay somebody 400 bucks but didn't have it, I could say, thanks, William, that was a $400 deal. If you take a $400 credit in our system, then you're 400 up, I'm 400 down. Mm -hmm. That is my promise is your money. And basically those systems like Edgar Kahn's time banks were out at the same time. Um, commercial barter business to business models were already well established. They've got the 20, 30 years practice before this point. And we're basically um, making um, a commons of that facility that the ability to make your, to make a promise in the world and have that act as a money is equivalent, I think, to the promise of free speech. Mm. You know, if you've got it and use it, you got it. If you don't, you don't. And our mission process um, in the last several decades and the next several years, I hope, is to um, communicate that option to people who've basically got it in their hands already. I mean, these phones, our connectivity enable us to have a social network that is positively social rather than the anti-social network that colonial money is. You know, um, the object of value that came in with the invaders, the owners, the acquirers is a linear money, which it has value and we dance around to follow it, follow the trinket. Um, and it's driving our import export dependencies, our cash crop stuff, it's creating, it's creating poverty um, I'm a solid believer in the thinking of Henry George, um, thanks to Tom Greco for introducing me to that, or bringing it to the relevance of action. Um, we've got to get back to a form of stewardship of the assets of all our relationships, rather than ownership and control, which is, of course, the, the Western imperialist guns, germs, and steel package. So. We're looking for that which makes the gift economy a substantial reality as um, a community builder, a convivial society on the Illich level. Um, the, I think the best source for this is, is Robin Wall Kimmerer's work, The Braided Sweetgrass Book, is an exquisite uh, deposition of what a gift economy means. Mm. And, uh, and there's so much Pollyanna nonsense about gift economies that I think it's very important to distinguish between quality and 
vapidity, should I put it? <laughs> and you know, yes, we all want to be happy, we all want to be nice, we all want to, be, but you can't just trust that. Don't like. Did I say trust? I try not to use that word. I really don't. You like, did say that. Complicated. Have I said enough, Ken? Better take me up from this. Let's, let's <laughs> well, I was letting you dig yourself in. No, it's like, oh, I dig so, it. <laughs> so, in the past, we've talked about the difference between linear money and circular money, which I always find to be such a powerful distinction for people. And um, can you can you just riff on that a little bit for folks who are? I, I don't know the level of of um, what we have here for knowledge about local economic trading systems, complementary currencies, gift economies on the call. I know we have Kevin Jones just joined us, who's who's definitely a, a local economic guy. If you don't know Kevin, I'm happy to introduce you. Oh, yes, and, yes, Kevin and I. Hi, Kevin. Um, but just give us a few a few pointers on on how these things distinguish. And if you want to show something, that's totally fine. I can help you. I can I'm going to try. The, 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 um, I'll have to get back into a different view. Otherwise, I won't be able to see what I'm talking about. So self view. Going high tech on us here. Oh yeah, high tech. This is, um, but it's not showing self. You go to gallery. This is what the technical competence is amazing. This is where we started. Okay. That everybody lives in their own barrel. That the money comes in and goes out, and it's easier going out than it is coming in. That's what seems to be true for every entity in the economic accountable set. What we were saying is, look, um, a community is a cluster of barrels inside its localization or its regional barrel or whatever, and you cannot plug the leaks. Mm -hmm. You can't do it. What you must have is an internal connectivity of reputation and relationship and experience. Now, that's basically what, what our project is, is that circularity is a resonance within a sort of a give and get, a give and take. It's the, the normal form of money is, oh, it's not mine until I've got it. And then what does it get? What does it promise to give me? So our games with conventional money are, give me, what, what am I getting? What do I get out of this? What can I be assured of? Mm -hmm. Which is paranoia. So what we're saying is that it'd be better to have relations in our communities working on the basis of what we bring to each other without damaging you know so we want um, a, a cooperative event rather than the competitive event of most most monetary affairs when i go to the supermarket or the restaurant or my whoever it's like playing through a screen how much of my stuff is he going to get she going to get what are they taking and so on and it's like playing battleships through the, the fog, you know? And so it's high jeopardy and it puts us all into a, a fear, uncertainty, doubt behavior, back to the lizard brain, back to the egocentric consciousness, best the, the sort of the divided community. Well, a circular money is gonna bounce off the locality. It's not gonna bounce, it's gonna be attracted back into the hub. You made a promise. And that promise is basically going to be the kind of the loyalty that you generate and emerge in your own world. So the circularity is, is sort of the karmic issue. It's the, uh, the old theory of cast your bread on the waters, you know. Mm -hmm. It's the, the concept if you build up too much, you get a jubilee problem. Uh, mm -hmm. you get, um, and we've got a huge problem with the stacks of assets that our investment community, when you know the think and grow rich world mm -hmm. has been about you've got to have it. And if you've got it, you don't want to let it go. So when I hear people talking about investment, 90% of the time, they're actually talking about return on investment. The presumption is, I've got it already. And I've gone to help you, but I've got to get more back. Because if I don't get more back, I'm being immoral with the, you know. So it's, it's to get ourselves out of that double bind that dilemma of can we live in good relation with uh, a quality of openness and creative contribution the, the reciprocal roof idea you know reciprocal roofs that build on each other well normal western building is 
against. You balance two things and hope they stay in place. And if they collapse, it's, and we tend to be dual in, uh, in our designs and architectures. But a reciprocal roof is where one thing lifts a little bit of another that lifts a bit of another that lifts a bit of another. And if you look up reciprocal roofs on images on Google, you'll see exactly what we're talking about. And it's, it's about compositely lifting a load together so that we all benefit from being small interventions tangentially. It's not about we've got this great project. If we all plug into this great project, that'll drive people crazy. It takes them off agenda. It takes them out of their skill base. But if, on the other hand, I can give you a bit of help, which means you can give them a little bit of help, which means you're saving them something, then you've got this reciprocal gift moving around the community. So help me understand this. If I um, if I want to join a local economic trade system, the, the one I'm most familiar with is um, Ithaca Dollars, because I know there's this pretty good, you know, robust community there. But how, you know, what do I do? Do I have to put money in? Do I put time in? What do I do? And then how does that, how does it flow through the system? The easiest way to look at it is that if you make promises that are within your capacity, you're in good shape circulating them as your, as your contribution and participation. Mm -hmm. At the moment, our promises in a monetary world, are how good is your credit rating? Can you borrow money from the bank? Is, you know, and those are really risky. And if you make a promise to pay a debt, legal tender, through the bank, you're, you've got your head in the noose. That's not a comfortable place to be. Now, if on the other hand, you can make a promise to people that, thanks, Ken, you, you put four hours into my project or my garden, or my, and I, I'm, that was, you know, 100 bucks of my time. And I, I'm, I'm going to make that a fungible promise that you can, you know, trade off with Doug or Jose or, you know, like, because, and that's money. Mm -hmm. But the money is, is supported not by, gold standard or you know a, a reserve against it it's it's supported by the willingness of the committed and the contributors the people in your community to be in a, a positive interaction which we can be with our skills and our time we can't be reliably in such reactions with uh, land uh, with product with cash flows with government behaviors whatever so promise theory mark burgess very elegant depict, uh, designation. No, he's got it down, and what you can what you can expect from a promise mm -hmm. is what shows up. So, is it primarily time? Like everyone's time is equal. <clears throat> we all say no. Okay, no, that was, start... that's a great model, and that's Edgar Kahn, you know, who died a few months ago, I think. And it, it's tremendous for social favors, but you don't get the dentist. You don't get the grocery store. You don't get the tax accountant. You don't get municipal taxis. You don't mm -hmm. get youth employment projects. You, you can't do it with a time bank. You do mm -hmm. the socials. And it's a very clear pro, 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 proposition that I'm amazed that, for instance, Van City is a cooperative credit union in, in Vancouver. Why are they not offering time banks to their communities? Mm -hmm. Why not? You know, but that sort of question is something that the, the, the those behind the pillars of power are rather reluctant to entertain. So mm -hmm. our, our agenda at this point is to try and bring ethical monetary practices into unethical institutions. You know, at some point during this interview, I always ask, you know, what's your vision of 2045? And we chose 2045 because it's far enough on the time horizon where you can sort of clear off the immediate stuff and see what's what are the, the longer term trends. And I'm not asking you to prognosticate. I don't expect a prediction of the future, but what are you seeing around currencies that are really positive trends? If they keep going in 2045, what, what's, what's an economy going to start to shift and look like? If we have circular economies of sovereign money that's stable in communities, what we will see is, is sort of equivalent to carbon capture with the current technologies, you know, membranes or adherence to porous surfaces or bury it in a fracking tunnel somewhere, you know, and that's called carbon management. We've got similar problems with asset piles. And at this point, the assets that are held in private or corporate ownership are a major destabilizer of everything that we're dealing with. We have to 
also bring those back into the sort of Commonwealth. And we have um, the intent of capturing a certain proportion of consumer spending for things like land trusts, youth development, hospitals, schools, this sort of things on a local level, and not just capturing that money, as it were, and making it a community asset, but also starting this kinetic energy in the exchange space so that by the cash being pulled from general consumer expenditure in the linear pattern into a land trust, for instance, um, uh, reconciliation, uh, all sorts of issues, then we become more able to steward, not just by the capital asset, but also by the mechanism, or should I call it the organism of the community currency, which becomes uh, the vitality. So you, 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 it's sort of potential problem becomes potential benefit and kinetic energy. Now, if this goes on, as we intend it to, <laughs> then the future will look a hell of a lot faster, better than you could possibly imagine. That's hopeful. Well, Where I hope so. I'm, I think it's very important that we, we have a non-dystopic perception of the possibilities. Uh, Phoebe Tickle had a very well um, articulated co the concept of moral imagination. Mm -hmm. what do you think is going to happen right and if, if we don't in, include that in our, our behavior then then how do we know where we're headed you know so so creating realistic possibilities that have a tangible impact could change the way a lot of us see the possibilities and by seeing things in a more positive way i think we can become more of the butterfly than the caterpillar in this gig you know that um, we're in a transformational process mm -hmm. and transformation will happen very fast. I'm thinking a um, matter of three or four years from adoption of some of these ideas up the S curve to largely saturation of the process. And the impediment is not technical. It's not delivery. It's reception. It's the ability that people have to modify their, their fear-based understanding of society, world, economy, business, life, municipal, government, Christ knows what, mm -hmm. and find um, a way of working with it. If, if we can find a way quickly through the, the liminal, through the, 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 through the glass darkly, through the, the smoke and mirrors, get behind the curtain, then we could be at something like um, regenerative capacities, um, globally, I'd say within five to 10 years. F full employment, um, almost complete uh, extraction from oil and gas, uh, hydrogen energy as the main carrier. Um, I mean, I could go on for a long time about the fantasy, but it'd be about 20 hour work week would be enough to support a family in, in this context. Not enough to keep you busy, there'll be plenty to do. And frankly, recovery, regeneration, um, search, rescue, uh, coastlines, water issues. We've got a lot of work to do and we better get it working. Now, yeah. that was my return to, in 1985, we had a 2020 vision project because we thought in 35 years we'd have this handled. <laughs> so don't buy my timetable until you <laughs> got in there and, and it makes sense to you. Um, uh, that's so, so my next question is, is kind of a two part. It's it's where are you encountering resistance to this and how where are you seeing the resistance being overcome where this is actually taking root and, and flourishing? Um, we come resistance everywhere. Paradigm shift is huge. And with the the forced drive of neoliberalism, the monopolistic model. The, the, we're in a company town. You know, Michael Hudson's analysis of the, um, the banking system as a parasite that made itself the host is, yeah. is very appropriate. Now, you don't fix the parasite, nor, nor do you escape from the jail, because the jail has already been broken out of many times and they keep fixing the locks. Don't worry about it. You know, one of the, the leaders in economic community currencies, Tim Jenkins, escaped from a high security prison in Pretoria 
by using wooden keys. And it's a very interesting story. And Daniel Radcliffe did a movie on it uh, a year ago, Escape from Pretoria. But you can't do that again. If we're gonna get out of the mess we're in, it has to be an orthogonal shift. That is, it has a lift above the plane under which we're, or out of the, the dimensions of our current context. Mm -hmm. It has to be out of left field. Now, most people do not like climbing into something that's going to change their world without history, recommendation, assurance, and, you know, insurance. Mm -hmm. So, we have a, a behavioral and a credibility issue to, to manage or to deploy, uh, make a, a replicable meme reliable, fast, and effective. And the one we're looking at is the 10% difference, basically. That um, this is a Bateson distinction. The, the difference people notice is a 10% difference. If, if I gain 10 pounds, I'd notice. That wouldn't be 10%, but I'd notice. <laughs> <laughs> But, but you don't notice one or two, you know? So right. similarly here, what we're proposing to the small business community, particularly, not the big business, although they'd be interested too, not to governments, not to what, but to the small business community is, how would it work for you if you could create, if you found something that w was 10% improvement in your cash flow, your sales, your employee um, remuneration and your whatever. If things were 10% better, would you notice? Well, if that's a noticeable target, we can play through an imaginary experience of that. We can build a modeling projection package that allows people to take a realistic scenario and sketch it out in such a way that a business can find out what issuing its own money enables them to do. Because if businesses are effective in a local community, then you can buy your bread and you can buy your beer. Mm -hmm. it's, it's both necessities and circumstances. So that communication is our, our task level. And we want to make it through a game um, and through a mid video mm -hmm. and through propagating those videos through their own um, recursive relevance. That is people will be able to replicate this in their own communities rather than wait for us to do it so they can send people to, to study and go away and whatever. You know, it's passing the meme in um, not an uncorruptible, no, it's, it's not, and it's not proprietary and it's not franchised and it's not, it's just, if you want to ride a bike, you'd better get on the bike. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the, the run bike of community currencies is sit on it, don't fix the steering, don't make square wheels, keep moving. It's the swerve that makes it work. That's our gig. And, uh, Again, Gobart says you you ride, you should get ride a bike by going like this, right? That's it. Yeah. So I have a question for you about um, universal basic income. You mentioned a few minutes ago that you know we could get down to a 20 hour work week. With a 20 hour work week in a local economic system and universal basic income, it sounds like we could pretty much take care of everybody and give them meaningful work and have a much healthier society. Do you think that's a reasonable thing to aim for? Oh, entirely. I'd say enable reasonable to work. Uh, mom, we're, we tend to be tied to unreasonable work. Um, mm -hmm. Graber, uh, the bullshit jobs, they mm -hmm. work for the man, company town, 16 tons, and what do you get, you know? Yep. So if, if we had convivial community currencies which work and show good, um, good management, good consequence, totally tax legitimate, no messing around. In fact, this may be the solution for municipal tax problems. Mm -hmm which isn't going to come from higher levels of government, you will notice. <laughs> you know, preparedness right. is something you got to do where you are, not, not expect the cavalry coming over the hill. Yeah. Cavalry. Who needs the cavalry? <laughs> um, so UBI as a fix, I don't like because it's taking the same distributive process and trying to channel it up and down again. It's redistribution and it's not fixing the problem. I like the idea of universal basic access, universal basic sovereignty, universal basic agency. Um, having the right and the ability 
to do what needs to be done and have it fit into the community in an effective way and have it all on your phone. <laughs> That's how I'd like to see it. Yeah. So fantastic. So you mentioned you're you're working on a game. Um, is that game available? Is it an app? Is it going to run on phones? We're, we're going to find this. Uh, and my question is, I actually had this a couple of weeks ago when we had, um, I've forgotten the gentleman who was on from England who's doing the, the Caring Communities. Um, what was his name? Um, I, I wrote, you know, can Michael develop a game that shows the harm that our current economic system does and then contrasts it with a local economic system that shows how that feeds the, the Commonwealth? Is that in your plans? Well, exactly. And in f the, the contrast would be the Monopoly game, mm -hmm. which, of course, was um, derived from the work of Henry George, Progress and Poverty, and the work of Elizabeth Megley, uh, the Landlord's Game, and the Prosperity Game, both of which depicted the exact problems of ownership as the opportunity to withhold and control. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it was Parker Brothers, who corrupted the copyright, stole the proposition. But it was the neoliberals in the 50s and 60s that progressively dispensed with the possibility that there was any other way than greed is good. So if the first part of your question, can we make a, a game that demonstrates the problems? Yes, it's been done. It's been done. <laughs> Look around, right? <laughs> what we're looking for is, um, is a, a platform through which people can explore alternative ways of sort of playing the same game. So imagine six people around a table and moving players around and doing transactions, but hey, that money gets us into scarcity, this money gets us into sufficiency. Great. And so noticing those is the possibility that we can bring not just to children in schools, not just to economics texts in university, but perhaps to economic development practitioners, either the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary Club, or local government, whatever. If you don't know the difference between money that drains right out of your town and money that stays in and supports the community, then you don't know the difference between a blood transfusion and an internal circulation. So get with the program. And we will have, we hope to take the components of this game within about five weeks, we want to be bringing that to Texas to the Emerge Gathering at the end of June. Fantastic. Um, and so that's that's the agenda is to, to show the possibilities, not to deliver them, mm -hmm. because that's that would be rising for a fall, but we can sketch mm -hmm. the possibilities of a game that pays for the movie that's made to show the game being paid for itself. Great. So that any community can do that. Good place to um, to open this up for questions. I saw Kevin Jones had his hand up, then we got Mark and then Stuart. So Kevin? <clears throat> yeah, uh, really interesting. I, I have, a, I have a, a lot of thoughts, but I uh, have an immediate practical uh, situation. We're about to have a fund going into a displaced community, displaced by the Vanderbilts and the Biltmore. Uh, that are the, the kind of the, the anchor of our billion dollar tourism. And then they moved the folks in Shiloh to build the Biltmore Village. And so they make hundreds of millions and the folks they moved are in bad drainage and they don't get anything. So we're going to have a repair fund. Uh, the Biltmore wants to be there. The Tourism and Development Fund wants to be there. They want to be on the right side of this thing because, you know, it's a, this could be really embarrassing. And we're also a, a, a city in Canada that's looking at reparations. So they've called in consultants and they're fighting about the definitions and accounting down at City Hall. And no one wants to be, they want to be out in front of the academic consultants fighting about the meaning of words uh, to be out in front of the branch. So we're going to have money coming in and to the Shiloh community and to others. And we want it to be community directed. And we have ways to do that and people to work with. And so since we're going to have regular fiat money coming in, I was wanting to replicate uh, Will's uh, Serafu currency and grassroots economics because it's the same way because his stuff is funded regularly by uh, development agencies on a reliable basis. It's and swirling so, backwards, though, Kevin. That's, that's yeah. catching the, the drainage and slowing it down. It's a passive form. It's functional, but you're taking the... You're, you're attempting to slow down the leakage. 
Now, the way we need to do this is actually to create the activity within the community that is supported by these cash flows and collaborative injections. It's like a, an electric transformer. You don't mix the, the different voltages, you have them <laughs> through transformers. Now, at the same time as Will has been doing his work with grassroots economics, um, M-Pesa in Kenya has made very substantial impact upon the proliferation of monetary processes. Now that's the banking of the sure. unbanked. I've got you on that. I know and it's still, they're still dealing with a scarcity deal, but the same technology could be used for localizing m pesos in every community as sovereign self-generated currencies. Now, this is what we're looking for is, is the technology, which is dead easy, getting through this impasse of of do you have something to sustain or are you just throwing jolts at it? Like, you know, stand back, boom. It's not well, one other thing I need to inject to, to get your reaction here is we're building a network of donor advised funds as public utilities for the common good. We've got one started in Indianapolis and one uh, in Buncombe County where we are and going to be right. in, in the, uh, um, Cincinnati soon. And, and we're building a network those things and and then uh, stimulating demand in all different kinds of ways and so we will have ways that you can you know donate into these things but also do catalytic venture philanthropy where the fund gets paid back or the fund from your church or your club or your whatever gets paid back that you have your own account uh, what should we do with the currency around all the stuff we're building uh, change money it's uh, if you look at the origins of crowdsourcing, was it made it possible to help? I need help, and help is sometimes out there. Then we got into crowdfunding. Help, I need money, and yeah, we can get money through these processes, but the costs and the proliferation of these technologies is limited. We're suggesting that you can upgrade from a Patreon model, the crowdsourcing, uh, crowdfunding model, to crowd changing. And if you look at the community way concept, the thing we call co-vestment, it's on openmoney.org slash CW, you'll see where we're doing this capturing to, um, to basically empower exactly what you're talking about as a persistent life form, rather than a plug the leaks and pray package, which is all legitimate, it's all ethical, it's all appropriate, it's just, I think it's, it's trying to fly a bus with wings. It's, it's, you're, you're mixing the, the, the technologies. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about this, Kevin. Yeah, it's I, a I, real clear we're, area we're about, of distinction. Yeah, that's great. We're about to set up these marketplaces. And uh, so it's time to look at what we want in and, and how we design it. You know, we can get people to give us money. And we have good folks who are going to uh, well, get the money. They are the people I want to meet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we can tell those stories. Okay, so thank you. If you guys don't have each other's contact, I'll be happy to, to get them to you, but um, I want to move on. I we think have other we probably, yeah, yeah so. sure. Thank you. All thank right, you, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. No doubt, Michael, you know, theoretically, I have no doubt that you're on the on the right track that it's a wonderful way to cure so many of the ills of our current society and culture and create a society that, 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 that works for, for all. No, no doubt about that. And, and, it's, and it's interesting. But. Where's the but? <laughs> and, it's, and it's interesting. No, no, there's no but. Buried, buried in Mark's last statement about cash flow, to generate some level of sustainability is the whole economic paradigm yeah. that, that we've all been brainwashed uh, into. Yeah. That being said, there are amazing and powerful forces in place to keep the existing economic and political paradigm. All right? So- How do Mike, we decouple the bomb as it were how do we yeah, do this the exactly yeah. my question is what's the what's the plan the thinking for the transition of both mindset and also you know people stepping into this new level of 
of of functionality, new way of new way of being in the world. I think it, it's about uh, changing the responsibility. Well, I, when I was I started in oil with Shell, and they taught us a lot about what burns, and they said it all burns if there's oxygen and heat. <laughs> you know, uh, so if there's material fuel and there's the temperature and there's air, you got a problem. Take away one, you're all right. Now, what's driving the greed and acquisition is the control you get by having more. The more I got, the more I, I, I've got it. And the interest on that is the thing that's driven that wealth in America curve. Remember that curve of, yes, right. Now, nobody wants to come off the curve, do they? Because <laughs> you, you know it, you may not get on a chart, but, but don't want to slide down. Now, we've got to show people ways of resolving that paradox and dilemma. The people who are most at risk financially of losing current holdings are the people who are filthy, stinking rich. Remember what Jeff Bezos said to the, market, the retail industry, your margin is my, my, my opportunity. Now, the stack of precarity that is embedded in our financial system, the, the I'm being precariousness, which is pray that it stays up, like which is where the banking system is at the moment. These assets are not seriously supportable. How are you gonna come down off this pillar of salt or whatever it is that you're in? So we're gonna give the asset holders in our community channels through which they can actually support the community with their assets rather than separate it. Now, the classic on this would be the Schumacher Society of Great Barrington, with the share project where depositors were able to allocate their deposits to particular lending practices and carry the risk of that. Now that's a responsibility that I really like to see our communities take on. And um, it's a major part of that interface between large capital assets, large interests and returns that make it sensible to shift a little of your weight here and take it off that pedal. So that'd be my long answer. It's a long answer. It's a long question. Love to have more on it. But so, so it's a, it's a, you know, as, um, um, as, as Kevin's project is, it's a, it's, it, it's at the local level. Yeah. Um, that's the major organizing principle. Absolutely. And it's got to be able to, to manage the flow. One of the problems we had with the first traditions of let systems and the like was that people didn't know what to do with it because it generated something and then it sort of puffed out and displayed all over the place. What we're expecting, what we must anticipate with the evolution of the current levels is that unless there is solid, secure, open banking to capture and make clearly manageable the, the collective currencies and the conviviality of the commonwealth of your community. Oh, three C's in a row there. But, but basically, unless you can handle it well, it will look a mess and then it'll be vulture time. And I don't want to go there. Beautiful. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll love to continue the conversation about changing the human mindset <sighs> in order to make That'll that take change. a few years, but let's I know. carry on. We've got <laughs> that, that's, what, that, that, that's what kind of tickles me, okay? We'll have another call for that. Right. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. Patty, please. Oh, glad I let Stuart speak first because he set my question up beautifully. I'm going to borrow the a lot of the bones of Stuart's question and just tweak it a little bit. And that um, my question was around how do we, how do you, and I don't know that there's an answer to this. I suspect a lot of folks who, any of us who are trying to create a movement and this paradigm shift are trying to answer this question, but how do we bridge the gap um, of all the fear and scarcity and doubt that has been so deeply programmed into, you know, our, I, I can speak for American culture and that we're kind of all in this drip, it seems, this IV drip of doom and, and the lizard brain, right? How do we, how do you foresee the bridge from moving out of that and into a place where communities are willing to opt into trust and trying something different? Your thoughts? Imagination, mm. play, projections, scenarios, um, robust and rigorous analysis 
I don't want pie in the sky. I want things that you can document, you can track, you can modify, you can play with, you can move the slider on this, you can, you know, you can, you can game play. Mm -hmm. And the game play will allow people to handle most of their uncertainty and doubt and fear to the point of at least dipping a toe into this process because it's not an either or we're not saying you know go sell everything you got and join the commune new no. mm. been there done that didn't work <laughs> um you know what we're saying is can you do, do sort of hamburger helper in the in in the meal plan you know can we modify can we bring them like a magnetic field onto the iron filings so that they all make a pretty pattern hey now it's almost like that. It's it's realizing that when we deal with the conventional money, it spills out, and we're always plugging leaks and arguing about who did it and competing with each other. To you know, it's it's oh my god, the nonprofit sector, ah, it's hell, right? So if you can find something where it's not a dome that everything pours off, but it's a dish where it's all sort of cross relating to it's a soil generator for your economy then that's a transitional process that builds and breeds and uh, that's that's our, our perception is small positive steps that actually pay off for the, the the pizza parlor for the restaurant for the local retailer for the car mechanic for the professional for the health services particularly for the brewers you got to remember that the 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 Irish had a you got to remember the Irish had a bank strike in the seventy two. You probably wouldn't remember that, um, and all the banks closed, so they had no cash. And this was before all checks and whatever were very effective. So it really was a problem until they realised that the pubs were happy to take money and pass it on to the brewers. Mm. And eventually, um, at the second phase of this. Uh, most employers were paying their employees in checks of a denomination. So if you were due 320 quid or something, you got six fifties and two tens signed off by your employer. Mm. Now that was sufficient to create an entirely effective year in the Irish economy in the early seventies. This is well documented. Mm. And it was a naturally emergent reconciliation of needs it was the beer end the beer bread and circuses it was the circuses end but man we need that sort of thing so i'm i'm actually we've been looking into the possibility of beer money um as a stimulant and um but not restricting it to that uh our other targets are uh, recreational equipment inc um, in Britain, we're looking at John Lewis Partnership. And in a global scale, the primary one I'm interested in is IKEA. Mm. Not because they're great organizations per se, but rather because they, they give you a, a conjunction between a large, a large consumer group and a large employee group. Got it. Michael, thank you so much. Well, thank awesome, you. Awesome work. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Patty. Mr. Breitbart. Yeah, I um, I sort of found myself at the coal face of this, where um, there's a friend who's taking an established company and seeking to transition it into the form you're talking about. And, um, and where he was sort of a stopped was where in the transition, he all of a sudden had securities less. Saying, well, you can't have general public participating in this. They have to be qualified investors mm -hmm. because of risk and all that stuff. <clears throat> and I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, what if you take ownership out completely? So if there's no property to own, there's no securities laws because securities laws regulate fractional ownership of a thing. And if there's no thing, 
uh, and there's no ownership, there's no regulatory imposition. <laughs> it's a different relationship for sure. It's, um, and that is exactly the edge between responsible participation and irresponsible exclusion. And I, I totally support the Securities Exchange Commission in trying to keep a lid on the crap that goes on in the money biz and the, the, uh, the venture areas. And uh, people who go in there, well, let's, let's just have a Bitcoin, the, not Bitcoin, the, the cryptos. You know. Yeah. And Ponzi, can you spell it? It's five letters. <laughs> <laughs> but people can't. So the, we need to be protected from stupidity and all that bullshit. But there are other areas where it would be dead easy. Um, and it's in this, the slack in the business, the empty restaurant table, the, the, the stock on the shelf that's getting a bit stale. The, 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 you've got to get those, those onions out of here before they take over. You know? <laughs> There's all sorts of things that work better when they move than when they're held. And we are moving into a society which is going to be much more interested in patterns of flow than who's got the nouns because the, the nouns ain't going to cut the mustard much longer. It's, it's what are your connections and how do they work? Michael, I want to thank you. This has been a pleasure, um, very enlightening. I'd like to thank all of our participants today for joining us. Mm -hmm.